So in this video, I'm going to do just a very kind of quick introduction to uh, the Jewish author by the name of Philo. And uh, he's a pretty important uh, primary source to be familiar with. So Philo's kind of period of time is 15 BCE to about 50 uh, CE. And some of the things that are interesting, he's very rich and very influential Alexandrian Jew, meaning he is a Jew who lives in the city of Alexandria in northern Egypt. Um, and so he's very sympathetic to what we call Greco-Roman culture, particularly with regards to education, clubs, association, politics, uh, things like that. Uh, now, when we talk about Hellenistic Jews, that is, are in one sense, all Jews are really Hellenized because Hellenism is pervasive over the entire area. But some Jews are uh, have embraced more of the Greek outlook, Greek worldviews, Greek thoughts, Greek practices. Uh, and so sometimes they are described that or labeled as Hellenistic Jews. But, you know, really, it, all Jews have been Hellenized. But... Philo represents a Jew who has really bought into a lot of the philosophical outlooks um, of, of, of Hellenism, of Greek thought. And so we see this coming out in his literature as he's trying to write, he writes in, uh, in Greek, and it seems like he's trying as well to explain the Jewish faith, as it were, to others, maybe other Greek-speaking Jews, but also to maybe non-Greek-speaking Jews uh, who may have questions about, you know, this faith that uh, Jews have and why Jews are doing certain things. So he's a very important person to become familiar with, especially when someone we want to understand something about Jesus or understanding about Paul or other New Testament authors because he's living roughly around the same period of time, although he's living in northern Egypt rather than in Palestine. Uh, he is influenced by the philosophies of Plato, uh, uh, Pythagoreanism, uh, and Stoicism. And so these philosophies that he has become acquainted with have kind of helped and form and shape the way in which he reads uh, biblical texts, or how he understands biblical texts, or as he tries to uh, present um, things that are found in Torah, or things that are found uh, in Scripture, as a way of kind of defending Jewish Judaism to uh, people who are kind of curious about it. Uh, he's a very prolific writer. He wrote about expositions of the laws. He wrote exegetical commentaries. Uh, applied hermeneutics, um, wrote things, Pentateuchal and philosophical dialogues. So particularly one of the things you know you might be familiar with is what we call the Socratic method, where you know you ask a question and somebody gives an answer and then you ask a question based on the answer and they answer, they give an answer back and you ask another question based on the answer that they give and, and you you just continue this until you arrive at some kind of uh, you know, foundation or some kind of key idea. Um, and so we see that Philo will oftentimes explore topics in this kind of question-answer format. So with regards to this person's life, Philo Judaeus, uh, uh, he, the life that he kind of lived, he lived again from uh, 20 BC, I said 10 BC, but 20 BC in the Egyptian city of Alexandria. So uh, this is the largest diaspora community. So in other words, uh, it's the largest group of Jews outside of Palestine. And uh, once again, heavily influenced by uh, Platonic traditions. And he sought to make the writings of Moses intelligible to the greco roman world by particularly using allegorical interpretation. So an allegory, you know, you see one thing, but something stands for something else. So uh, through allegory, uh, there's this kind of means of you can tell a story or you can make observations about life. And then, but something here stands for something else. 
So he's going to take allegorical approaches in order to interpret the Old Testament so that what might look on the surface that the author, the biblical writer, is talking about one thing, he's really talking about something else. So uh, he came from a very prominent and very wealthy family. Uh, his brother, Alexander, was a Roman governmental official uh, in Egypt, uh, an alabarch, and uh, is wealthy enough uh, to pay to plate nine out of the ten temple gates with gold and silver. So just think about that. There are ten temple gates, and Alexander, Xander is wealthy enough to plate or cover nine of those gates with gold and silver. So here is a family, has this attachment to Jerusalem, and has a lot of money, and demonstrates their loyalty to, uh, to the temple by this action. His nephew, Marcus, interestingly, married uh, Bernice, who is the daughter of Herod Agrippa I. So... Uh, another nephew, Tiberius, just notice these names again, Marcus, Tiberius, very Roman names now. Uh, his nephew became a procurator of Judea in 46 to 48, so uh, the time after Pontius Pilate. So Pontius Pilate was um, a procurator, uh, and now Tiberius uh, is. And so he's related to Philo. And then he was procurator uh, of Egypt. This term procurator basically means it's not exactly like a governor. Uh, it's like a, a administrator, a financial administrator over the region. But with some, as well, jurisdiction to carry out punishments or to carry out other types of, uh, of administrative affairs. Um, Philo's civic leadership can also be seen in the fact that he was selected to head a Jewish delegation um, to appeal to Gaius Caliglia, the Roman emperor, uh, on a, the decision of a prefect there in Egypt by the name of uh, Flacus. And so there was a great deal of disturbance within the city. Jews were feeling uh, harassed persecuted or at, at odds, and so they needed help. They needed uh, an intervention from the emperor uh, in order to solve conflicts that are going on. And so Philo is one of uh, the few others who has been kind of chosen by the community. So he has an enormous amount of sway, influence um, within not only Alexandria, but also probably in other parts of, of the diaspora. So there's a lot of interesting things that one might uh, want to take a kind of look at um, in comparison to Philo in the New Testament. I'm not going to go into all of those, but um, you see this kind of emphasis on circumcision in the uh, Pauline Judaizers. Um, so, of course, again, when you think about circumcision, um, this is a physical act, um, and, you know, Philo knows that, you know, this is something that Jews do, but he wants to interpret the act of circumcision as really being about something else. He kind of allegorizes what this particular act is, what it's supposed to refer to, kind of the removing away, as it were, of the, of the, the devices uh, that a person might, might have. And so it stands for that, that ongoing desire to present oneself as, as righteous, as pure. Uh, and so, you know, you kind of wonder as well some of the things that Philo has to say about circumcisions and what we, and what we see in the Pauline Judaizers, these people who are you know, kind of calling for uh, Gentiles to be circumcised uh, in order to belong to the Christian community. Of course, another important area of for Philo and New Testament is the use of logos. So Philo is influenced by Stoicism. And in Stoicism, the logos is uh, this all-compassing reason. Paul, I mean, 
Philo will use the language, the Stoic concept of logos, to talk about um, this force that is at work in the world. Uh, and so when we have Philo talking about logos, and then later on we're going to have John's prologue when he talks about uh, the logos becoming uh, enfleshed, uh, the word, as it were, of God becoming enfleshed. It's interesting to make these kind of comparisons heavenly realities, look at uh, Hebrews 8, uh, 5 as well. Uh, so this is quite Platonic, and the idea for Plato, the heavenly realities are what's real, and everything else is kind of a shadow. And in the book of uh, Hebrews, we also see this kind of contrast between uh, things that are going on in the heavenly world um, and how they are reflected on things that occurred on earth, especially through uh, through Jesus. So, and Philo also shares in this kind of understanding of, of realities that are in the heavens and then what gets reflected on earth. And what, sometimes it might be interesting well to look at Philo's view of women and make a comparison to how that looks at um, how the New Testament uh, authors also treat, uh, treat women. So some of Philo's works are the interpretations of the writings of Moses, which combine Jewish beliefs with philosophical categories. Uh, he has philosophical writings. He has kind of a historical apologetic writings. Uh, this uh, Flacus, who was his uh, procurator um, there in Egypt. Uh, Hypotheca on the uh, embassy to Gaius, Gaius Caliglia, uh, on the contemplative life. So it's both telling a history, but it's also trying to provide a defense, this apologetic idea um, to explain uh, why Jews believe what they, they do or what it is that Jews in, in their faith are doing. Uh, what's also interesting is that Philo's works were primarily preserved by Christians. So uh, that is just a few details about Philo that I want you to be able to, uh, to have and to think about. Certainly, you know, there's a lot more that can be said about Philo, there are lots more things to investigate in terms of, of his writings and the writings of the New Testament, since they were all coming at the same time. He's a Hellenistic Jew. The authors of, of much of our New Testament are Hellenistic Jews. So uh, becoming aware of Philo in order to make kind of comparisons and contrasts uh, to see similarities, uh, this is an important primary source, not for, only for understanding just the different kinds of Second Temple Jews that existed, but also uh, a primary source for understanding how the New Testament writers kind of fit into this world of Second Temple Judaism.